It's Hi, Sam. It's been about 15 or 20 years since I taught college, but I found if I stood in front of the room silent for a while, the room would get silent. It was pretty amazing the way it works. <laughs> Thank you for attending tonight. Uh, my name is Kim Morey. I'm here with the Historic Rapid City and Rapid City Public Library's Oral History Program. And if I went through the complex connections that lead us to Lisa, that would probably be the program tonight, but you're here to listen to Lisa speak. So uh, I would like to say that, uh, that uh, the, the library and Historic Rapid City have begun and, and continue to work on a, a, a project of collecting our local histories. And there is that connection. This is a bit of our local history that you will talk here. And I would also um, like to mention the, the generous support of the South Dakota Community Foundation and the Community Innovation Fund grant to help us get this done. It's kind of like when you hear on National Public Radio about funded by the Joan Rock. Uh, I'm not sure what they called it now, but, but you'll learn more about that as well. Uh, I've spent a good part of the last day and a half or so with Lisa, and, and this, I've been in town only since 1978, so uh, I'm, I'm learning that, that I'm still a newcomer to Rapid City uh, through the eyes of a person from Los Angeles, California, and it has been a very interesting process. I, I have very much enjoyed this, and I'm sure that you will enjoy what Lisa has to say, and if you have any questions about what she talks about or what I mentioned about the oral history program, you'll be glad to speak later, won't we? Yes, I just volunteered so. you for that. So, all right. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> it's really exciting to be here, and I won't add too much to that, except I have to say thank you to Chief Kesselop, who I met through Reed at Minnelusa Oops, Historical Society when I wrote a few years ago and said, I need help in Rapid City. There's this whole period of Joan Cox's life that existed that is not documented, and I need someone on the ground to help. And Jean is a model award-winning citizen, and she's a fantastic person, and now she's become a friend. She connected me to, to Kim, and then there's the Abramson's represented here. Everybody here has been really fantastic, and to make history come alive, it takes people who are on the ground in a place. So um, what I'm gonna show you right now is how I got interested in Joan Kroc, how I found out about her life here as Joan Smith. And the reason I wanted to talk with you now, even though it's not for a year before my book comes out, is in the hopes that you might have some memories that you can share with me about Rapid City in the 60s when she lived here and afterwards. Uh, we, we continue to find out more about her every day um, and, and why it's important. So hopefully this will explain that. I have to remember to tell you that I am not related to Bill Napoli, who I guess is a <laughs> lawmaker here in the yes. state. Uh, that's not a political statement in any way. I just have no relationship to him and people keep asking me if I do. So I will um, start by explaining to you, and thank you all, by the way, for coming. I forgot to do that. I really appreciate your being here. I um, cover art in Los Angeles, the country of Los Angeles, I like to call it, because it's a very weird place. I'm not from there. And um, about four years ago, I went to cover this sculpture, which is a 26-foot tall nuclear mushroom cloud. It's not a very nice sculpture. It's right outside the Santa Monica Civic Center. If you've been there, you probably have never seen it, because no normal person would ever go to this particular location and see this not very attractive sculpture. And um, I went there because, as in other places, but particularly since we're here as guests of the historic, uh, historic rapid uh, city, uh, they were gonna knock that 26 foot tall mushroom cloud down because it was falling apart. Those chain links were falling to the ground. People were worried because kids gathered around it. They were worried that maybe kids would die. 
um, somebody would die. So this peace activist on the left here, who's named Jerry Rubin, but who's not the yippee of the name, Jerry Rubin, if you remember back to those days, was organizing protests about keeping this um, sculpture going. And I went to interview him on this particular day, February 1st, 2012, and I said to him, Jerry, why is it that they have to knock this down? Why can't they rebuild it? He said, well, you know, the, the person who funded it is deceased, and um, she didn't really, she didn't give this money, uh, she gave it anonymously, he was hedging. And I said, well, who was it who gave the money? And he said, oh, well, you probably know who she is since you work in public radio. Her name is Joan Crock. And I said, that's weird. Why would Joan Croc want to fund a peace sculpture, not very attractive one, in Santa Monica when she lived in San Diego? And of course, because I worked in public radio, you can't help but hear Joan Croc's name. Public radio listeners here, I assume. You hear her name repeated half a dozen times a day at least. So I knew that she'd given an enormous gift when she died to public radio, but I didn't understand why she'd want to have anything to do with this sculpture. And that's what has pretty much occupied me. Um, as many people in this room can tell you, and all the people I, I live with and love will tell you, for the last four years, is figuring out why it was that she was involved with the peace movement. Um, now, finding out information about Joan Croc was very difficult because when she died in 2003, she didn't want anybody to know much about her history, her foundation, had been dissolved years before. She didn't give in a very public way most of the time. Um, she was notoriously secretive. But of course, it was easy to find out information about McDonald's um, because, uh, and I'm presuming here that you all know that she did marry the man who supposedly was the founder of McDonald's. It turns out that these two gentlemen actually started McDonald's in uh, 19 even actually a little bit before 1948, in San Bernardino, the desert of California. Uh, they started a hamburger stand, and that's what it looked like. That's actually the second version of what McDonald's hamburgers look like. And just judging from the folks in the room, some of you may remember that hamburger stands at the moment in time, the 40s and the 50s, as roads were becoming better used, uh, cars were becoming more common, hamburger stands became very, very popular. So there was nothing unusual about this particular hamburger stand, except that these guys, Dick and Matt, came up with a system to create their product. They called it putting the fast food, their fast food on the assembly line. They wanted to move it quickly, get people in and out, no car hops. Car hops were kind of sketchy. Uh, they, they wanted to find a fast way to get their food, their very limited menu, as you can see. And if you didn't know this, I, I didn't know this when I started researching it, that, that there were nine or ten items on the original McDonald's menu. It was very, very simple because it was designed to get you in and out fast. You could feed the whole family for 45 cents a meal. Um, and it was, you know, good, wholesome food with milkshakes. Uh, really good, delicious milkshakes made with ice cream, real ice cream, on this multi-mixer. Now that's where Ray Kroc comes in. Ray Kroc was a salesman of these multi-mixer machines, and because there were so many ice cream stands and hamburger stands and soda fountains all around the country, um, he was making quite a lot of money selling these multi-mixers uh, to places like McDonald's in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, he had, before he started selling the multi-mixer, which was at the time a really incredible innovation, because the idea, I don't have to explain, but if you've cooked, you know it's very cool to be able to do five things at once as opposed to just one. He was selling paper cups before he sold the multi-mixer. So he was sort of on the cutting edge of, if you will, the uh, ruination of our diets, because of course, before there were paper cups and drive-ins, we were eating meals at home with our families, but the world became accelerated and we needed to move faster and we needed our food to go and Ray was a big part of it and made a, a good living. And you know, he wasn't, he wasn't poor, but he wasn't, um, he wasn't fantastically rich. He was upper middle class. He was able to take his wife of 40 years on trips and he was able to put his beautiful young daughter in, who is an aspiring singer, uh, to make a, a, a 
record demo um, at the time, and everything was just going along just fine with him until he met the McDonald's brothers, and he got this idea that the McDonald's brothers had such a great thing going that they should sell it everywhere. Now, the McDonald's brothers were perfectly happy with the way things were going. In the, in the early 50s, they were making about $100,000 a year profit, which is pretty good money. And they had Cadillacs, one had a wife, there were no kids, they had a nice house, they all lived together. Life was good, they worked hard, but they didn't feel the need for more. And Ray Kroc came along and said, this is a great idea, let me franchise this idea across the country. And uh, long story short, he went uh, across, or long story, a little bit longer, he went across the country with some help in search of people who wanted to propagate these golden arches that these men in San Bernardino had developed. And part of that involved people who were just eager to get in on the ground floor and have their own business, but part of it involved people like a man named Jim Zine in St. Paul who had this very elegant restaurant called The Criterion. It was right up the street, it, the structure of it is still right up the street from the St. Paul Capitol. And it was uh, just the place where people went for lobster and steak. It wasn't an average place, it was for lawmakers and special occasions. But Jim Zine was like a lot of people, and it was mostly men back then, who were interested in this idea of getting into the hamburger game. Because the word was that if you got into the hamburger game, you could make some really good money fast, as opposed to running a fancy restaurant, which has much more overhead, it's a slower kind of pace of serving, um, different attention to detail. So Jim Zine was very interested in Ray Kroc's proposition for this, this uh, franchise, and he wanted to buy in. So when Ray Kroc came in 1957 to the Criterion to have a meeting with, with Jim Zine, uh, this young woman was playing the piano. Actually, she was playing the organ, and later in the evening, she would go to the lounge in the Criterion where she would play the piano for after-hours cocktails. And Ray liked his cocktails, and he also was a pianist himself before he became a salesman. He was a master pianist, actually. He made uh, a good living as, as a musician playing in early, early days of radio in Chicago, where he was from. And uh, so he was taken not only with this beautiful woman, because she was a beautiful woman, 26 years his junior, but uh, because she was an excellent, excellent piano player. Um, all of a sudden, and this is an odd, as a journalist for 30 years, I've never been a biographer. So inference and uh, platitudes are interesting when you're doing this sort of project. All of a sudden, uh, Joan's husband of about 12 years was hired to run Joan's boss's McDonald's in St. Louis Park, Minnesota, which is nearby uh, St. Paul, where they all met. And so Jim Zine was given the right to build this first franchise. This was store number 93 uh, of McDonald's. I, I can't remember how many McDonald's there are right now because I'm much more of an, an old McDonald's person than I am a new one. But 90, store number 93 was very early on in the McDonald's constellation of, of conquering the universe. Um, and this community flipped out when these guys came to town and said they wanted to build this McDonald's. They didn't want it there. They thought car hops, they thought crazy shenanigans, um, all sorts of bad things were gonna happen to society because this, this um, hamburger stand was coming into their nice suburb of Minneapolis, but they lost. And uh, Joan, Croc Joan Smith's husband, Raleigh, was hired to manage this St. Louis Park. And, and while St. Louis Park was getting up and running, the early McDonald's folks, that's Ray, second from the left there, this is the first five, these were the first five people in the McDonald's corporate landscape who were running around the country, mostly in Cessnas, uh, single engine planes, um, to just find people who were willing to sell them land to let them build golden arches on them and then hopefully find people who would be willing to work 12 hours a day and do the back-breaking work, if anybody's worked in a restaurant, they know of, of keeping a McDonald's up, getting a McDonald's up and running. And so 
this kept going and going and growing and growing, and um, at a certain point, uh, about a year into Raleigh's tenure at that St. Louis Park McDonald's, he and Joan accepted the assignment to come here to Rapid City. So around the middle of 1959, they relocated here with their young daughter. Um, Raleigh had received a $12,000 bonus for his good work as the manager of the McDonald's in St. Louis Park and decided that, and that they chose, uh, they had the option of going to either Allentown, Pennsylvania, but because Raleigh was a Montana boy and because Joan was from St. Paul, they decided to come here instead and they built the first McDonald's over on Main Street, which is still there, not the same structure. Um, but they, they built the first one, and that was store number, at that point, 223 in the constellation of McDonald's. So, uh, again, long story short, a little bit longer, and a lot of suggestion and platitude. Joan, at one point, left Rapid City with Ray, ostensibly, well, not ostensibly, to go marry him. And uh, then she, several months later, decided not to marry Ray, and she came back to Raleigh in Rapid City. That was about uh, September 1961, um, and she settled back in here. Uh, by then, Raleigh was building another McDonald's, the one on Cleveland Street. And Ray uh, was devastated. He divorced his wife of many years, and married another woman, this lady, this lovely blonde lady, whose name is Jane. So he left, he had a June who worked for him as his secretary, he fell in love with Joan, and then he married Jane. And meanwhile, in the midst of all of that, uh, and, and apparently Jane and Joan, they say, resemble each other. I think they were just blondes, but you know how people do that when they think blondes all look like each other, or brunettes all look like each other. But so, he married Jane, who was actually secretary to John Wayne, and um, set up shop in Beverly Hills, and McDonald's went public in 1965. So before 1965, Ray was just leveraged to the hilt and uh, hoping that McDonald's would take off. The individual McDonald's stores were making good money, but the McDonald's corporate was perilously close to bankruptcy. Um, despite all kinds of efforts to, to keep it afloat. But in 1965, Ray's money man, Harry Sonnenborn, who's the unsung genius behind McDonald's, orchestrated an initial public offering of McDonald's stock. And in one instance, in July, one instance in July 1965, July 15th, um, they instantly became multi, multi-millionaires. All of a sudden, Ray was worth $33 million in 1965, and his longtime trusted secretary, June, was worth $5 million, and Harry Sonneborn, who created the whole uh, financial plan that made McDonald's vi viable, was worth something like $15 million overnight. And uh, Ray went out and bought himself a 220-acre ranch in Santa Inez, California. He bought Jane a beautiful diamond. He built a self-serve bar at this beautiful ranch. He started a foundation that gave money away. He hired his brother, who was a scientist who he hadn't talked to in years, to come up with um, a, a blueprint, basically, for him to give away money, because he had so much money, he just didn't know what to do with it. And around that time, the public perception of McDonald's had gone from, wow, McDonald's, great, bring the kids, to, wow, this stuff might be bad for us. This might not be such healthy food, because it went from being wholesome, locally sourced food to much more uh, processed food. So to combat the public perception of McDonald's, Ray started this foundation that, as you can see from some of these titles, wasn't exactly your typical give money to the Girl Scouts. It was, he was funding some pretty high-end, uh, high-powered scientific research. Well. All of a sudden, time elapses, as it does, and Joan and Ray meet again. I'm not going to tell you everything, because I really want you to read my book when it comes out. But Joan and Ray meet again in March, um, early, late, late 1968, and they do marry this time. Um, and they move 
two, and he got married at the ranch. They moved to Chicago. Um, Ray left California, moved back to Chicago. Joan went with him. And for reasons that, again, broad platitudes, I'm really not quite sure. Joan, who apparently was very unhappy, maybe some people in the room who can tell me more about this, who was unhappy in Rapid City because of her complicated personal life, all of a sudden, now that she was no longer living in Rapid City, started giving money to Rapid City. So in 1972, when the flood occurred, she um, came into town, flew into town on Ray's private jet, and met with Mayor Barnett and said, I'm going to write you a check for $50,000. If you tell anyone it came from me, I'm going to cancel the check, but I want to contribute. I want to do my part to help. And I think at that time, it was the largest personal donation to the flood relief effort. Right around um, that time, this library opened and she wrote another check to fund uh, the artwork that's immediately out the store, down the hall over there, and some funding for, I think, some research for the librarians, educational um, research tools. It's not really clear, but we do know that she was on the board of the library in the 60s while she, when she came back after the aborted first attempt to marry Ray. Um, so if anybody knows anything more about that, I'd love, love to hear about it. Because I'm trying to trace where her philanthropic roots are from, and they appear to be here, literally right here. So it's very exciting for me to be here. We just learned today, um, thanks to Sylvia, that uh, she gave money, perhaps a million dollars, to help somehow fund Crazy Horse. We read online that it has something to do with uh, the light show there. We'll find out more about that, but she um, she wrote a check for that. She was involved with a place called River Park. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with a TV show. Sorry, that's a bad slide, but it's a TV show, and it was now it's a book that was created by a man named Glenn Jorgensen, who was uh, involved in the government and peer and had a, a spiritual awakening as a recovered alcoholic and dedicated his life to building a series of rehab clinics around the state, one of which was um, at, I believe this is called St. Martin's, or was St. Martin's at the time. Uh, and I guess he incubated uh, an alcoholism education program in the schools here in Rapid City. And Joan was a silent funder of River Park and a good friend of Glenn's. Uh, and Glenn had a TV show that aired for 15 years in different markets all throughout the Midwest, uh, including around the state here, uh, which was called It's Great to Be Alive, which was um, interviews with people who were recovered alcoholics or somehow involved in the alcohol alcoholism uh, education movement. And now Joan became very involved with the alcoholism education movement. And in fact, it was probably one of, if not the most important, work she did. Um, her husband, Ray, was an alcoholic. Uh, he bought the Padres, the San Diego Padres, in 1974. And you may, if you follow baseball, may remember that he very famously got on the microphone and publicly berated the team for being so bad. And he uh, was a very colorful, outspoken character, but he had this affliction, which in the 70s was just being acknowledged as a disease, not a moral shortcoming. And Joan, because she had access to many, many millions of dollars, was very, very involved in helping to fund a lot of the early uh, the pioneers in the movement uh, to get alcoholism treated as a disease and have it cl uh, cl classified by the AMA and something that was uh, rehab be something that was, was uh, covered by health benefits. So she was a pioneer in that movement, but and while she wasn't silently a pioneer, she was uh, conflicted as a pioneer because she couldn't come out and say why she was so interested in the movement. She funded a series of films, this is the most famous of them, that were uh, shown all over the world. This one is still, it's been remade, and. Uh, is distributed by Hazelden, the rehab clinic up in Minnesota, where she's from. She uh, funded a film, a series of films that were very, very important in the, in the rehab movement, the al alcoholism education movement. She funded this book, which also is still used today. 
uh, about a young alcoholic revealing her, her difficulties. She created a cartoon character called Corky. Her group was called Operation Cork. Cork spelled crock, spelled backwards, and produced a series of public service announcements that aired all over the country. Um, she became very good friends with the Academy Award winning actress Mercedes McCambridge, who even before Betty Ford very publicly acknowledged her alcoholism uh, and of course became a pioneer who Joan funded. Uh, Mercedes McCabridge was a very outspoken and, and it was very controversial that she came forward and explained that she had been to rehab because at the time it was seen as such a terrible stigma that she might not ever work again. Um, then what happened, there was sort of a pivot point in Joan's life when Ray died in 1984. So she shifted from this work in alcoholism education to uh, working more in her community. By that point, they'd moved to San Diego. Uh, she, in 1984, after Ray passed away, there was a massacre at a McDonald's, and she stepped forward even before McDonald's did and wrote a check for $100,000 to help the victims in this very poor community, not far from where she lived. And that was controversial because McDonald's didn't know how to handle this terrible, terrible, tragic thing that happened on their grounds. Uh, but before they could sort of, you know, get their MBA heads together, she came forward and, and sort of stepped to, up to the plate. The same year, the San Diego Padres, which she had taken ownership of because Ray had died, uh, even though she said she knew nothing about baseball, that year, miraculously, the San Diego Padres were perennially the cellar-dwelling team, all of a sudden made it to the National League playoffs. So Joan got to do that on her, that happened on Joan's watch. Um, from there, she morphed into a peace activist, and that's where, in four years of research, I finally figured out how come she funded that peace sculpture pretty much in my backyard in Santa Monica. And she took out a series of ads around the country decrying nu nuclear weapons. Those of you who are old enough remember the cold, the Star Wars uh, end of the Cold War with Ronald Reagan. And she took these ads out and she started getting death threats because of it. Um, but she didn't let it stop her. She bought uh, this book, which came out in 1984, which was, again, a very important, popular book at that time, also very controversial. She bought a half million copies and gave them uh, out for free. Uh, she commissioned a song, which I won't play for you now, so we have time for questions. Um, she commissioned a song that was played at the commemoration of Hiroshima, and she went there herself. Uh, she, even though Ray was famously very, very conservative, and she was registered independent, she gave a gift to the Democrats in 1987, to the Democratic Party, not to any particular candidate, because she wanted to see them do outreach and, um, I guess, make, make inroads in ways that she felt they weren't making them. Again, she shifted more toward peace uh, around this time, she gave quite a lot of money to Notre Dame, where she set up an in International Institute for Peace Studies, where people come from all around the world to study peace and conflict resolution for free. And around that time is when she met the editorial illustrator, Paul Conrad, uh, who some of you may know. He was a Pulitzer Prize, three-time Pulitzer Prize winner. And he, uh, just as all good il illustrators are, was just brilliant and demonic with his pen. And he met Joan, Joan came to hear him speak in San Diego, and he showed her a sketch of a sculpture that he wanted to make. Um, and she, of course, was in the throes of her, of her peace movement and decided that she would fund this sketch to become this sculpture, which nobody wanted because it wasn't very attractive, but they made this model, they put it on display. Long story, a little bit longer, it didn't, get put up in Beverly Hills, it got put up in Santa Monica. And that's where I will start winding down the story by explaining that um, that was, that, that sculpture that initially got me attracted to and interested in this story um, opened up this whole world for me as somebody who isn't a big McDonald's person, um, wasn't uh, really aware of the work that she did, but but was very curious about why someone who has 
absolutely insane sums of money, decides to give it away. And basically what she did from the minute she inherited this money, before she inherited this money, um, and certainly after she inherited it, once Ray had passed away, she spent the rest of her life figuring out very interesting ways of giving the money away. She, as I said, dissolved her foundation because the foundation was too tedious. Um, it was too much work. Any of you who've worked in foundations know there's a lot of letters to the law that you must follow. And she was rich enough that she didn't really need the tax donation. She just was so wealthy that she could just write million dollar checks here and there for things that she thought were important or interesting. Um, which leads me to the end of her life where uh, about five years before she died, she decided that she wanted to give money to the Salvation Army to build a recreation center for poor kids and in a very poor community in San Diego. So she gave them, she, she had them come for lunch, she told them what they wanted, to, what she wanted to do, they came back to her with plans and she said, you gotta think bigger, make it bigger. And so she ended up spending $80 million to build a very beautiful, beautiful center. I think I've got the picture here, yeah. Um, just a world-class recreation center in this incredibly run-down neighborhood in San Diego. This was an abandoned shopping mall. And then it knocked it down and, and made this structure, which you're only seeing a piece of. Uh, and funny enough, San Diego on the border of, of Mexico, hot climate, she insisted that they put a regulation hockey rink in there because she loved ice skating when she was a kid in Minnesota. And uh, so there's a, a regulation rink in there, not something easy to find in California, where kids can go and just get skates and skate for free. So there's a whole generation of kids growing up in this neighborhood in San Diego who are going to be good skaters. But there's a whole lot of other stuff on the grounds in this facility. And it turns out when uh, she, of course, didn't know this at the time, uh, in 2003, when she was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer and given three to six months to live, she had about $3 billion at her beck and call. And she was faced with the decision of what to do with $3 billion with a very short period of time to live. And what she did was she gave the bulk of the money, two-thirds of the money, to the Salvation Army to build these recreation centers. So this it turns out this one was a and there, you probably know people all, all around the country who live in communities where one of these centers has been built. I think it's up to 31 or 32 now, all around the country. She gave, uh, she'd already given $50 million to a Peace Institute companion to the Notre Dame at University of San Diego. Looks like a palace, but that's a school. And she um, gave them $50 million more, and I could go on and on about all the different places that she gave money at the end of her life, but the long and the short of it is that she gave all of it away. She left some money for her daughter, she left uh, some money for her daughter's four daughters, but the bulk of her estate, including her own private home, her jet, and, and the mass of her fortune was given to charity. And it all really started here in Rapid City. And you know, there's all sorts of social stigma about having run off from your husband. Uh, and it's not a judgment about any of that, but I came here in search of stories and to learn more about Rapid City because what I find so fascinating is that she came from very poor means. She, she didn't have a lot. She wished she could have gone to college. She couldn't, she married at 17. Um, she played piano, she was very skilled at that, she carried three jobs as a young mother, and uh, from those humble beginnings, uh, fate took her in a very dif different direction. She, she took that direction uh, in, a, in a whole way that's influenced a whole lot of people, as I say, beginning right here. So I would love and be happy to answer any questions that you have, and I appreciate you listening. I love plenty of time. So, and, and comments, and by the way, I forgot to say that tonight, while we're here in Santa Monica, the city council, after four long years of a community outcry, kids collecting pennies in schools, um, and Hollywood celebrities stepping forward with bigger donations, the Santa Monica City Council got enough public support that they're tossing in the rest of the money 
and tonight is the night that they're giving the go-ahead to restore this sculpture, um, which I've grown to appreciate and like a whole lot more because it's sort of made my whole life very interesting for the last four years and introduced me to some of the great people in this room and now all of you. So thank you so much for your time. And I will say one other thing. So I, I have been working on this book, uh, haven't been able to find a publisher until Hollywood announced it was making a movie about Ray Kroc and the McDonald's Brothers. And I don't know if you've heard about it, but Michael Keaton is starring in it. It's called The Founder. It's about the drama dramatic, if you can call it that, uh, business deal between Ray and the brothers in San Bernardino. So the first five years of McDonald's. And it's coming out at Thanksgiving time next year. So thankfully, because everything in this world is about me tooism, the publishers decided they wanted my book. So my book will come out in a year from now as well. Uh, God willing, and I'll you know never know how everything works out. But the movie's supposed to come out in a year, and so is the book, which is focused, uh, as you can see, on a wider swath of both of their lives. But I thought it was interesting to look at how the fast food fortune that Joan gave away got made. So now you know a little bit more about it. And the movie will tell you its movie version of it, which is not entirely um, incredibly, perfectly accurate. But hopefully my book will be accurate. And if I can answer any questions for you now, I'm happy to. What is the name of your book? So my book, the working title, and it probably will be the title if it gets published under, is Ray and Joan. <laughs> The untold story of a man who made a fast food fortune and the woman who gave it all away. But you could just remember Ray and Joan. And I have cards up here too if you want to take it. And I hope the library will have me back next year when the book comes out and we'll promote that. But yeah, it'll be, and the publisher is Dutton. Dutton Books. So. Questions? Does anyone have any comment? Yeah. Nope, you don't have a question. Anybody have any recollections? Yes. Where does her daughter live? So her daughter lives part-time in San Diego and part-time in, I think it's Flathead, Montana. It may be, it may be Whitefish, but it's some part-time in Montana, part-time in San Diego. Did you get to interview the daughter? No. I have talked pretty extensively with the daughter, yes, yeah. The daughter is about 70 now, and her four daughters are anywhere from their mid-30s to early 40s. They're a number of, number of grandchildren. Does anyone remember, Linda? Do you? Yeah. Yeah. I liked her I, I met her when I first, she first moved here, and um, we were in grade school and junior high. Wow. The 38th Street house. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. I'd love to talk to you. Which church was it that they went to here? Trinity Lutheran. Did Joan play organ there? I don't I don't think so, but I can remember coming to school and she did play piano. Did she give lessons around town? Do you I don't think she gave lessons, but I did have lessons with her. <laughs> you we did? Had, we had the piano store. So we were friends. Oh. And I was struggling trying to learn to play the piano. She said, oh, I'll help you. <laughs> wow, at the piano store. No, at her home. Wow. Yeah. And she, was she as good a piano player as people say? Beautiful, right? You can't imagine. She, I can remember when, uh, who was the trumpet player that came to town? Mendoza or something like that, some big trumpet player. And he says, lady, you play like a man. And she's about the best compliment I've ever had. Wow. <laughs> wow. At the end of her life, right before she was diagnosed with brain cancer, when that Salvation Army Center had opened, they had a gala, you know, charged a lot of money to the community. And she had hired Tony Bennett in the past to, to play for events for her. And apparently she hired him for this gala, her own money. And uh, apparently she played with him. And there's no tape, but it would be really cool to hear. Wow, that's so interesting. 
Very interesting. So did you get good? No. <laughs> I didn't last very long. Yeah, no, I'm taking lessons now. It's time to catch up. Wow. <laughs> How did you find her to teach you in the first place? Because we had the piano store and she came in with her friends. Oh, I see, because it was your, in, your, in your family and she was naturally drawn to the no, store. she always came into the store, yeah. Where was the piano store? Where Michael's is right now at that time. It was, used to be Seeley's. And the perfect progress up to the corner later on where the clock shop is. But that was long after Joan was gone. Does the store still exist or no? Well, kind of. That's a batch I'll just have. have bought that from Dan. I'm grateful to hear now or afterwards more recollections about life here in the 60s because I wasn't here. And uh, it's helpful to hear all those kinds of things, which is why Jean and Kim have been so. Because we'd go to the country club and everybody wanted her to play the piano, and she'd play the piano for hours. At the at, at Arrowhead? Yeah, at our own country club. Just casually, not yeah, she wasn't no, hired just, to do it. Just they'd want, oh, come on, Joan, play the piano. So she would. Wow. But you never heard her and Ray play together. Apparently, Raleigh had a great tenor voice, I've heard. Linda actually said that. I don't remember him singing, but he was always there. Wow. There must be questions coming. Yeah. Did they always live on 38th Street, or was there? I thought there was a home on West Boulevard where they lived. We've heard that they moved to Doll Towers after Linda left. Um, do you, you know offhand? Does that sound right to you? I thought they moved, I, I remember Linda leaving like when I was eight. Right, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, and then when she, so she, Linda left apparently, went to school back in Minnesota, lived with her grandmother, <coughs> and at some point, I, I have it somewhere that Joan and Raleigh moved to Dahl. Oh, um, Yeah, and then when Raleigh remarried, he moved to Heidi Lane. Yeah, they Lane? Built home. They built a home off Sherry Lane Road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Is the home on 38th Street still standing? Yeah, oh, yeah. I was here 18 months ago when I was yeah. here. Okay. And we heard today that it was, they, they bought the home from the folks who owned, who managed the racetrack. Okay. The, the dog track, uh, Bev. Uh, Jim and Ken. Uh, Gump Gunther. Gunther. G U G H. What was the last one? Gent. Gent. No, it's Gunther. It's something well, it's unusual. Yeah, it's something I have it written down in a book somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, apparently that was the house that they, that they bought or moved into, and then... One of her closest friends here was Barb Ivers, and she used to fly Barb off to California on a visit. But Barb lives here, and so she would be a good person for you to talk to, because she would know the answers to all these questions. I have, to, I have talked to Barb, I yeah, talked to yeah, I talked to her last time I was here. Uh, I wasn't able to get her out tonight, but thank you for reminding me. Yeah, they, and they seem to be good friends afterwards. There is another woman, Lori Lindemeyer. Lindemeyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lindemeyer. She's one of our neighbors, yeah. Ah. Yeah, Lori yeah. doesn't live here anymore. She's in Denver, right? Yeah. Well, somewhere. Somewhere. And then Zell Lewis. A woman named Zell Lewis, I believe is her last name, was in, somehow affiliated with the Air Force Base. I just, I, I, I'd like to add that as somebody who's an amateur historian, I find this has been a fascinating exercise because I'm dealing with recent history, but uh, where, where there isn't a lot of documentation. And so this has been a very interesting exercise as a writer, if anybody here is a writer. Um, the whole idea of stitching together somebody's life, particularly somebody who's, you know, I've struggled a lot internally with um, the fact that Joan didn't leave papers, so it wasn't like she was making it easy for somebody to write the story. She didn't really want the story told, and yet at the same time, it's impacted so many people, particularly the alcoholism work. Such an enormous body of work that she funded and was very actively involved.
involved in. Um, my hope is that people will take away from the story, A, that history is important, and B, that philanthropy on any scale is important, and understanding where it comes from, because most philanthropy is deeply personal. Um, it's, it's a really, I think, terribly interesting an important message for us to hear about because we live in this culture where everybody's always talking about making money. Um, I think it's much more interesting when people make money and do something good with it. I mean, she certainly spent it too. She didn't live monastically, <laughs> but um, it's very interesting. Uh, are there are there things that you can say about what life was like in Rapid City? I know this this city suffered two very terrible tragedies very close to each other in 1968 and 1972. But earlier than that, it seems like things here, life here was good. Is that fair to say? I mean, I'm sure there were issues, but it was a happy place. A lot more quiet. A lot more, a lot more quiet. Quieter. Because I've heard it was very busy. Well, I, well, yeah, but I mean, you know, we didn't have all the crime that we have now. Mm -hmm. The cheerleaders? Cheerleaders. The spirit of So it's on Main Street in Santa Monica. It's about two or three blocks from the historic. Is it near the, it's not far, the city college? Or? It's not far from the city college. It's about 15 blocks from the city college. But if you know where the historic pier is, where the Ferris wheel is, of course, in the courthouse. I, I'll look up the address for you, or we can look it up. But it's it's literally right in front of the, court, the Santa Monica courthouse mm -hmm. and where City Hall is. Uh, there's actually a train that's coming two blocks away from there. But yeah, it's kind of a place you would only go if you needed to go to city council or pay a parking ticket or something like that. Not a well traveled What year was that installed? That was built in 91. She met Paul Conrad in 87, 88, had the idea. She took Paul Conrad and his wife on a cruise that, on her yacht, and that's where the idea came. And she said she would fund it anonymously, and uh, it took a while to get it to get it built. But yeah, 91 is when it was erected. So the other interesting thing is how I get I don't have this problem, but because she became so enormously wealthy and started Ray had started giving money away um, when he became enormously wealthy in 1965 and found, which is apparently common that everybody wanted a piece of the money. So as soon as you give a little bit of money, everybody's after you to give money to whatever it is that they do. So I think with the flood, uh, and I'm sure it was more complicated than that with the flood since it was right on the heels of her having left this community, um, she started, she also gave anonymously, you may remember the Grand Forks flood in 97. She gave $15 million there anonymously, uh, but she was outed because somebody the plane tag um, and realized it was her. Uh, but yeah, so she was very, that was something like this. Uh, this was only $250,000, but many of her gifts were much bigger and she was very, very private about them. So it's it's been an interesting challenge because what I want in the back of the book is to have a as comprehensive a list of her philanthropy as possible. And it's hard. So, yeah. When she donated the money to the Salvation Army Recreation Center, so is it just like a capital construction budget, or she get on ongoing maintenance and operating costs? Or good. So they're not scrambling every year or two years out of mind? Very good question. It was structured in a really interesting and, I guess, somewhat controversial way. It sounds like you know much more about this than I do. But she set up um, so that each of... I'm not so much about. I'm not so sure about the first one, but I know that in the big gift she gave, posthum that was announced posthumously, she set it up so that it was split regionally 
across the country, and then each region uh, assigned money to communities that felt it could raise matching funds to sustain the support of those centers. And the centers aren't completely free, it's kind of like a wide, it's a sliding scale uh, sort of thing. No one's turned away, but they do make some money from fees. Uh, but the commu it was up to the community uh, to figure out some money. So there are, there are some communities around the country that thought they were going to be able to raise the money, but weren't able to. So she sort of left it to them to figure it out, but she made sure that it was set up so that it wasn't just here, we're giving you money for this fabulous building. Whoops, how do we pay for the lights? Have they had the ones that have all remained viable then? So far, from what I know, I haven't I haven't studied them super closely, but um, it's my understanding they're doing well. The couple that came close, I'm trying to think of an example. I think there was one in Long Beach near where I live that was supposed to happen but didn't. Something happened with the finances, um, and it, it, it couldn't come through. But I'm pretty sure the ones that are up and running are sustain, sustaining okay. And the ones I visited are quite fantastic. I mean, they are always in places where you really need a facility like that, and they're really well, well done. So, controversially though, uh, it's interesting that, that she attended church because she had this sort of situation where uh, she didn't seem like a particularly religious person, and all of a sudden she was funding a lot of groups and organizations and people who were deeply religious. And so a lot of people think that she was Catholic because toward the end of her life she gave all this money to Notre Dame and to the University of San Diego, which is also a Catholic university. Uh, and she was very close with Father Hesburgh at Notre Dame um, and other people who were very in, in San Diego. She funded a homeless shelter and some other social services that were spearheaded by a Catholic priest uh, with whom she was very good friends. She was very close with uh, Father Henry Nowen, if anybody follows his work. Yeah, so she um, had these very deep ties. She's very, very, very close friends with Fred Rogers, who was not Catholic, he was Mr. Rogers. Uh, he was a Episcopal minister, I believe. But she, Presbyterian, sorry, thank you. But yeah, so she had all these very, she even joked apparently that she had a thing for priests. And they had a thing for her because she gave them lots, lots of money. She was also very close with Norman Cousins, who ran the Saturday Review, he was a big intellectual, very involved in the post-Hiroshima rebuild, one of, the, one of the Americans who was very involved in the rebuild of Hiroshima, she was very, very close with him. So, very interesting constellation of people who she collected post rain Did you ask her daughter, is her daughter Linda? Yeah. Did you ask Linda if her mother was Catholic? No. Oh, she, she definitely was not. Oh, okay. Linda feels that the giving was given, that she had some sort of spiritual, deep spiritual awakening, um, but it's just her guess. Uh, Linda is now married to a, a, a minister herself, a retired Episcopal minister. Um, so she's very devout Christian, and uh, I can't parse out whether it's her ascribing that to her mother 2020 hindsight or if it's that she was because because I've read interviews with Joan Cock where she's you know said don't believe in God but I don't <coughs> I'm not immersed in scripture so it's interesting all the Salvation Army centers have chapels in them and apparently she very much did not want them to but she was gone she had to trust them to build the center is so interesting. Yeah. Well, I really, really, really have enjoyed this. Thank you. And we wish you well with your book, and we hope you will return for a book signing. I hope you'll have me here. I'd love Absolutely. to come back. I'd love to come back. It's going to be an interesting, interesting time. McDonald's is not supportive of this book. Uh, McDonald's is not really interested in talking about Joan. Uh, who also funded McDonald House, Ronald McDonald House, with quite a lot of money. Um, so it'll be 
nice and people are friendly. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah.